What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about a new study on intermittent fasting. But first, click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for Al Gore. So recently a new study was published in JAMA, which is a very high profile journal, looking at the effects of intermittent fasting, but they, they referred to it as time restricted eating, which is the more technical way to refer to it, versus continuous meal feeding. This study had a couple strengths. First one, it was done in obese people, in adults, who didn't have any other comorbidities. It was for 14 weeks, which is a little bit longer than some of the other more recent time restricted eating studies have been. And it was in a decent number of subjects, it was around 100 people. They randomized people into the these two groups, either continuous meal feeding or time-restricted eating. And one note is that they were practicing early time-restricted eating, which is they were eating between 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. So their feeding window was eight hours, so they were practicing the 16-8 form of time-restricted eating, but it was early time-restricted eating. So a lot of studies have done the later time-restricted eating where they're kind of eating between like noon and 8 p.m. This was earlier. And the continuous meal feeding group was instructed to simply eat outside of that window more than 12 hours, meaning they wanted them to consume their first meal and last meal at least 12 hours apart. And they had them do this for 14 weeks and they looked at weight, body fat, adherence, diet satisfaction, a few metabolic and cardiometabolic markers, and one of their primary outcome measures was also looking at the percentage of weight that was lost as fat. Trying to determine was one diet better than another, not just for losing weight, but for losing a greater percentage of body fat. They called it selective fat loss. And they instructed these participants to lower their caloric intake by 500 calories per day approximately. And they also gave them nutritional counseling at the beginning, a one hour session with a dietitian, and then every two weeks for 30 minutes, which is probably why they had pretty good adherence in the study, although it wasn't different between groups. They did have pretty good overall adherence. Now it's important to note that it was a free living study and so they were not providing meals to the participants, they were just completely free living, but they were having them do dietary recalls to look at how much they were actually consuming. It's important to note that dietary recalls are extremely limited in terms of what they can show and people tend to forget what they ate. I know for myself, I have a hard time remembering what I eat for breakfast in the morning, even later that day. So dietary recall logs are limited, but it doesn't make them bad. It just means that this is one of the limitations of free living research. Now, one criticism I do have of the study before we get to the results is they had them weigh in every two weeks with the researchers, but in the non-fasted state. I'm not quite sure what their reasoning is for that, but when you're not fasting, that can introduce quite a bit of error. I'm not saying that it necessarily affected the outcomes, but it definitely introduces quite a bit of error. Grant Tinsley talked about this in his talk at ISSN when we were there, just in terms of how much fluctuation and error you can introduce by not using fasting measurements. So that would be one thing I would ding them for. But overall, I felt like the study was pretty well designed. One other criticism I have is to assess their selective fat loss metric, they only used people who lost at least 3.6 kilos or about eight pounds. I understand why they did this. They wanted to see what happened in the most adherent people, but they didn't really provide a justification for why 3.6 kilos was chosen. And so if you're just going to randomly select a number out, usually you have to justify that number. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I didn't really see a justification for that specific number number. What can happen during these experiments, although I don't think it happened in this experiment based on their results, is people will kind of data hack to look through and find a cutoff number that if they use that number, now they see differences between groups. And so that's not a good justification. What should be a good justification, for example, would be well, we were looking for people who lost at least 5% uh, of their body weight or 10% of their body weight because X number of metabolic improvements are associated with this weight loss or, or those sorts of things. But I didn't see any of that in here. I didn't look at their supplemental tables, but I don't think it was in there either. And so I really would have just liked to seen a justification for that specific number that was used. 
So let's get to the results. Both groups lost significant weight, significant body fat, and improved many of their cardiometabolic markers of health. And there was a statistically significant difference between the weight loss out of the time-restricted eating group and the continuous meal feeding group, with the time-restricted feeding group losing about 2.3 kilos more on average than the continuous meal feeding group. That being said, they did not see a difference in the loss of body fat. They did do a subgroup analysis of completers only, so looking at only people who completed the study, and then they saw a slight difference in the amount of body fat loss with it favoring the time-restricted eating group. So that's it right there, right? Like time-restricted eating, this study shows it, it's the best thing ever, it's better than continuous meal feeding. Not necessarily. The authors did say that they did some modeling of these people's dietary intake and showed about a 200 calorie reduction in the intake of the people on the time-restricted eating, which explains the difference in weight loss over that 14 weeks. And they did not see any selective fat loss in the group. That is, time-restricted eating did not lose a greater percentage of their weight from fat compared to the continuous meal feeding group. There was also really no differences in uh, dietary satisfaction, and there weren't any differences in any cardiometabolic markers of health between the two diet groups, other than diastolic blood pressure, which was four millimeters reduced in the time-restricted eating group compared to the control group, but that's probably explained by them just losing more weight. And four millimeters of mercury, is, it's a significant difference, but it's not a very clinically meaningful difference. So when we look at things like uh, glucose, insulin, HOMA IR, cholesterol, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, none of those things were different between the two groups, which again, one of the big claims by many people who promote intermittent fasting, like say Jason Fung, is that it's way better for insulin sensitivity. Well, even in this study, they didn't see that. So now what do these results mean? The people in this study reduced their energy intake in the time-restricted eating group more than the people in the continuous meal feeding group. But based on the energy intake, both groups lost the same amount of fat. So this lends credence to the idea that if you like intermittent fasting, it's a completely reasonable tool to use. Per calorie reduction, it is not going to cause more fat loss than say, continuous meal feeding. However, one of the things I will say that I used to think like 10 years ago was the idea that intermittent fasting was gonna cause more loss of lean mass. I don't think I can really say that now for your traditional 16-8 intermittent fasting protocols, especially when people are doing resistance training and eating sufficient amounts of dietary protein, it just doesn't seem to cause loss of lean mass. However, in some of the more extreme fasting protocols, such as alternating day fasting or 24 fasting, there have been some studies showing some loss of lean mass. So what I would say is at least with your traditional 16-8 intermittent fasting, I think that's fine in terms of maintaining lean mass. Now, some people do have difficulty consuming enough protein on it because you're narrowing your feeding window. So the only thing I would say is if you're going to do some form of time-restricted eating, make sure that you're getting in enough total protein and trying to spread that over at least two or three good-sized doses of protein, if not four, if you can. I don't think this study shows that intermittent fasting is superior. It doesn't. But if you like intermittent fasting, and many people do, and you feel like it makes it easier for you to adhere to a caloric deficit, then absolutely it's a great tool to use. The one downside about this sort of intermittent fasting they're using is the early time-restricted eating. While they didn't see it in this study, I think it's possible that this form of time-restricted eating might be a little bit more difficult to adhere to because their end cutoff feeding window was 3 p.m. Most events, holidays, get-togethers are at night. They're at dinner. This might be something hard to maintain over a very long period of time because of that. But if you like it and it works for you, it's an absolutely reasonable way to do things, but I don't think it's probably any better than time-restricted eating later in the day, although we need more data and some direct comparisons and research studies to elucidate that. If you guys like these research breakdowns, Make sure you subscribe to my new research review, Reps, 
which is research explained with practical summaries, where we take five popular studies and break them down each month into a format that's palatable for anyone, even if you don't have experience with reading scientific articles. We tell you what the results were, how they tested it, did they use the right things to test it, and do we even agree with the results, and what do the results mean for you. Make sure you click the link in the description to check that out. It's only $12.99 a month. Great investment if you want to take your knowledge to the next level. Check it out, and I'll catch you next week.